So welcome to um, the financial structures and practices of the art market. Um, we are first going to um, uh, hear from uh, the Sorbonne Nouvelle, Emmanuel Avril, who is going to present the hosting for the first day. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the not so exciting part of the conference, so I'll be very, very brief, I promise. Uh, I just wanted to say that the Center for Research on the English Speaking World, CRU, uh, which has been based in its current form at the Sorbonne Nouvelle since 2008, is very happy to host or co-host uh, the sixth edition of uh, the workshop series on tools for the future. Um, just to say um, that the originality of our research group uh, is the fact that it brings together scholars who collectively take a transdisciplinary and diachronic approach to the English-speaking world from the 18th century to the 21st century, and uh, who thus cover a wide range of dimensions, such as political, economic, social, and cultural dimensions. Of course, we would have much preferred to welcome you all in person here in Paris and to be able to socialize around a meal or a drink. Uh, but we still hope that you will find the conference riveting enough to keep you uh, in front of your screens for the next two days. And the program uh, looks incredibly promising. So I'm sure that uh, this will be the case. Um, that's what I wanted to say. And I want to let the organizers Elisabeth Lazzaro, Benedict Miyamoto, Nathalie Mouro, and Adriana Turpin uh, present the conference. That's all from me, and have a great uh, time. So thank you really, Emmanuel, for this introduction, and uh, also for continuing with this workshop, with this workshop and adventure that started precisely two years ago as the first tool for the future uh, was held in, uh, on the 7th and 8th of June 2018. And here yeah, I would uh, like to pay tribute also to Adriana Turta, who uh, is the person who had the idea to organize this kind of meeting. Adriana and I uh, met in uh, the context of classes we gave at IESA, which is a partner of uh, this session also. Uh, and uh, we frequently discuss and confronted our point of view as an art historian uh, and as an economist. And we discuss about the art market. And at that time, Adriana Turpin told me, but we have to organize a workshop in order to bring, to build bridges between uh, disciplines and establish a common methodology to see um, where, where, what uh, things that meet to be different in reality are not so different and they are common framework. So uh, because of that, we, ha uh, we have the idea of this meeting and we wanted to have an international meeting so that we ask uh, El um, Elisabeth Lazaro, who is a great researcher, to um, to organize with us uh, the first conferences and we decided to have three different meetings. The first one was in France, in Montpellier, and it was about art collectors. The second one was in the, in, uh, the Netherlands with um, Elisabetta and it was about um, the artist as an entrepreneurship. And the third one was in London, uh, uh, and because of uh, Adriana, of course, and it was about emerging market. And very quickly, uh, people who attended this workshop decided to continue. And it was really great for, for us. And then we had another session in Roma, uh, thanks uh, to Paolo Cohen, and then in Ljubljana uh, with these marvel marvelous girls, Tina Kozak and Renata, were really wonderful and uh, we organized a, a workshop about law and the market and now because of you uh, we are in Paris uh, and uh, the workshop is, uh, is about uh, the finance on the art market so thanks a lot for continuing this great adventure it's really fine to see uh, all this discussion uh, and thank you uh, to all of you uh, for your commitment and uh, now it's time to work. <laughs> okay, so have a really good discussion. 
Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to just spend a little time to warn everyone about the technical parts. Um, so first I'll address the people from the workshop. Um, during uh, the um, speaker's presentation, please turn off your mic and you can turn off your, your video um, also so that only the speaker and the speaker screen is the center of attention on YouTube Live. If you follow the YouTube Live, you will see that there's a slight discrepancy in time. So there's a, a time lag, um, but that shouldn't affect how we take the questions. So for everyone here, both in the workshop and on YouTube Live, um, the tradition inside the Tools for the Future workshop is that after a panel, we first give the opportunity to the panelists, the actual speakers, to talk to each other. Um, with They've had pre-circulated papers and they, um, they can see the intersection of their own papers. Then uh, we'll have the workshop people um, introduce their own questions in the chat and then we'll, we'll take questions from the YouTube chat so we can interact with the YouTube live. So thank you very much. Um, we're now going to have our guest speaker, Sophie Ka. Um, all of the registered attendees have received the conference pack. Um, so they, with the bios and the abstracts of all the speakers. Um, so we will limit our presentation time by not um, uh, pre presenting them live, but you have all the information in that pack. Please use it to continue the conversation even after the workshop. We'll be very happy to receive your questions and to continue whatever good questions come up here um, in this workshop webinar conference. This is a bit of a hybrid of everything. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, um, uh, first of all, to the organizers for their kind invitation. Um, somehow I wasn't able to share my own PowerPoint, so Benedict very kindly agreed to do that for me. And uh, I'm sorry that I'm going to <laughs> require some work from you to just pass on the slides. So I guess we can we can start sharing the PowerPoint right now. I'm, I'm really happy right. to be part of this exciting conference. You can see some familiar faces on the screen and uh, also meet new colleagues even if it's only virtually. So this is going to take just a little bit of time, also because we are slightly in advance. So I would just like to, to bear in mind people who would log on only at 10 to hear you, Sophie Ka. So okay. um, we'll wait just a little bit before you start so that no one comes afterwards. Um, I would still like to um, pull up the presentation. All right. Shall we start? So can, can everyone see my presentation, the presentation of Sophie Ka on the on the screen? Yep. Um, maybe Sophie could just speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, it's. I just checked my speakers and they are at a hundred percent. So I think that would help you help. Thank you so much. May I start now, Benedict? Yes, I think that you can go. Okay. And just tell me next slide when you want the next slide. Okay, perfect. So in investigations on the art market, precise discussions about artworks are paradoxically rare. And this is the art historian speaking, of course. 
Most studies focus on uh, figures of dealers, collectors, experts, auctioneers, critics, and so on. The labor of the artist, on the one hand, and the exchange market for the products yes. of this labor, on the other hand, are often, though implicitly, treated as two distinct domains. One pertains to creation and has the artist as its center. The other pertains to reception and relegates the artist to the margin. This methodological distinction is heir to an old tradition of thinking, which conceives of the creation of a work of art as largely independent from its subsequent distribution, circulation, exchange, and pricing. This conception is quite widespread, even among artists themselves, such as uh, Joseph Beuys, for instance, you can see that on the next slide, who expressed this idea in a very clear form in 1971. He said, a potato that is cultivated and cared for by a farmer doesn't suffer any damage even if the merchant who sells it is dishonest. The area of creativity, art, and human freedom rests upon a different principle. Therefore, art is not degraded by the abuses of the market. It remains thoroughly and absolutely intact. In this conception, the market, and more specifically the money flows that sustain the commerce of art, is something that simply happens to artworks without affecting their very nature. This doesn't mean that the economic structures of the art market shouldn't be contested by artists. And indeed, Beuys was one of the artists who most prominently denounced and contested the art market through diverse actions and boycotts in the 1970s and, and, uh, and, and 80s. But whatever the abuses of the market, Beuys thought that art remains thoroughly and absolutely intact. Human creativity and art are protected against commercial corruption by virtue of the fact that they operate on a different level. This philosophical view silently traverses a number of our basic conceptual tools. I already mentioned uh, the distinction between creation and reception that we often um, rely on, but I could also point out the structuring distinction we make between the primary market where artworks are sold for the first time and when uh, artists are concerned and the secondary market or resale, ma resale market where financial speculation operates and where artists are generally absent. In today's presentation, I would like to take a different standpoint and argue that the financial logics of the art market have consequences for the creation of art itself. I will look at how the idea of art as an investment went from fiction to fact, and then from fact again to fiction. The first section will look at the increasingly sophisticated tools that were developed to make speculation in arts a reality, and will study artists' reactions to these devices. The second section will go from theory to practice and discuss some attempts by artists to build art alternative prices and uh, selling modes for their art. The final, the final section will inquire into uh, an example of work which makes speculation itself the very substance of art. Next slide, please. A history of speculation in art remains to be written, and in many ways, it defies the methodologies of our disciplines. Indeed, as much as what distinguishes a fake from a mere copy is the intention to deceive, what distinguishes speculation from any act of buying or selling is the financial motive. Now, rigorously asserting the motive behind people's actions remains a challenge for historical, sociological, and economic investigations alike. If we can hardly trace speculation itself, what we can evidence is the development of tools designed specifically for financial speculation. Comparing artworks to stocks and bonds, auction houses to stock exchanges, and collecting to financial speculation is a very old cliche. 
that goes back way into the 19th century and even earlier. Emile Zola, among others, famously described the merchant Naudet in his 1886 novel Love as a speculator, a dealer in stocks who sells his canvases to the rich dilettante who knows nothing about art, who buys a picture as he would a security on the stock exchange, out of vanity or in the hope that it will rise in value. At this point, though, the idea of art as an investment is essentially a metaphor. The metaphor starts to give way to reality when the practice of art speculation starts to be institutionalized through identifiable devices. In the beginning of the 20th century, long before expert knowledge on the art market took on an academic form, with the pioneering work of uh, the economics and sociology of art in the 1960s, a number of analytical tools were deployed, which already showed an effort to objectify knowledge on the subject. Léa Saint-Raymond, uh, among others, has documented for the interwar period a phenomenon that had interest me for uh, the post-war years, um, the post-Second World War, uh, the way in which economic instruments started to be used to deal with artistic objects to produce new knowledge about the art market and the logic of prices. It was during the 1910s and especially the 1920s that the main directories began to appear regularly, listing the auction prices achieved by artists in alphabetical order. These dictionaries uh, were directly modeled on the quantitative tools of financial market analysis that had appeared only a few years earlier for stock market investors. For Léa Saint-Ramon, the consequence of these tools was the emergence of what she calls a financial habitus among the actors of the art market, based on the mastery of a set of knowledge valued as indispensable expertise to act on this market. Let us underline right away two important points. First, just uh, like Nathalie Moreau has shown with today's classifications and indexes, by cl claiming to describe phenomena, these tools, in fact, contributed to actually producing them. With these directories, the notion of an artist's rating took on its full reality, practical and no longer merely metaphorical. Second, if these analytical tools were conceived for the use of art dealers and collectors, it is quite obvious that artists themselves were concerned from the outset. Numerous historical sources indicate that they followed and accompanied their development. Next slide, please. Unsurprisingly, the reaction of artists to these quantifying tools of market expertise was generally downright negative. Vasily Kandinsky, who was himself trained in economics and briefly held a professorship in political economy and statistics before becoming an artist, published a long article in 1939 entitled The Value of a Concrete Work. In this text, he sharply criticized the methods then commonly used to estimate the value and price of works of art. He concluded, I quote, as for me, I'm glad to know that there will never be scientific measures of value in art. Indeed, such measures would present a new obstacle to our effort to understand art. For Kandinsky, what it, it was not so much uh, about rejecting the very idea that art could be an object of knowledge, and in particular economic knowledge. Kandinsky was rather denouncing the consequences of a quantitative approach to artistic value, which according to him would prove harmful, not only for the appreciation of art, but even for the creation of art, by encouraging artists to anticipate fixed criteria of value. Next slide, please. In the decades following World War II, Quantitative tools for, the, for market analysis extended considerably with three main characteristics. Firstly, they took on a decidedly visual dimension. Tables of figures were substituted with graphs. The artist's rating was now visually embodied in a drawn line. 
the graphic representations of data started to accompany and even replace the photographic reproductions of artworks in publications, both for uh, specialist audience and the general public. This assimilation between these two kinds of visual identity for artwork struck many observers at the time. Secondly, these tools were becoming more ambitious as they moved from the near formatting of raw market data to more sophisticated tools for analyzing these data. This is what Anne Verger has called the invention of the hit list in the second half of the 1950s. The, the vogue for rankings, indexes, and other measurement tools, allowing market players to compare reputational value and price. Thirdly, the scientific pretension of art market discourses increased as the actors of the field, such as dealers or auctioneers, were uh, progressively discarded in favor of actors coming from outside the art field. First of all, financial analysts, and then academics, such as economists and sociologists. Next slide, please. From today's perspective, the scientific pretensions of those graphs may give rise to smiles. As key instruments of persuasion, graphical representations were deliberately manipulated to support the claim that, on the one hand, works of art can be considered as the equivalent of shares, and that, on the other hand, they are both in the short and long term more profitable than any rival investment portfolio. The almost inviolable use of continuous lines to represent what was in fact only a small number of uh, separate public sales was a deeply misleading way of producing a plausible analog of uh, the historical course of the stock price. Moreover, these graphics uh, typically covered long periods without taking inflation into account. The curves they traced, therefore, rose all the more steeply than actual uh, stock price curves, which reflected the corresponding rise in the consumer price index. Making matters still worse, the underlying analysis was contaminated by a patent retrospective selection bias. The graphics did not display information concerning all the work sold at a given moment, but only a supposedly representative sampling that in reality was made from a small pool of the most famous artists. Uh, next slide. As a co-author of the pioneering Times Plus Viz Index of Fine Art unwittingly revealed, I quote, the Impressionist Index, for instance, is based on the work of six artists, Monet, Renoir, Sisley, Pissarro, Pantalatour, and Boudin. We may therefore agree with the British art historian Gerald Ratzinger when he scorned these graphics for, I quote, fooling around with computers to produce an allegedly scientific averaging of a given painter's prices. However, for all their clumsiness and naivety, these graphics partook to an historical phenomenon of increasing quantification of art market information that would mark the following decades. The promotion of expertise and the claim to, quantitif uh, to quantitative uh, objectivity sorry, uh, made it possible to present speculation in art as accessible and secure for any rational investor. Next slide. The art market guide and forecasters, for instance, said it was able to spot um, the new unknowns and the, and the rediscovered masters before anyone else but without leaving any place to intuition. And I think if you uh, push next, um, this will appear in, uh, uh, in yellow. Yeah. Um, by employing, I quote, the same disciplined analytical methods and carefully researched technology used by the most successful stock market investors, um, the advertisement said, the purchase of art could be established on a factual, no-nonsense basis. Later studies by uh, Noah Horowitz and by Olaf Bensoit and Erika Kostler 
have shown that the popularity of the first speculative art investment funds in the 1960s and 70s depended on creating elaborate databases and increasingly sophisticated analytical tools that gradually convinced investors of the transparency of information and the trustworthiness of predictions. However, as much as they were ready to literally integrate artworks in the realm of financial securities, the promoters of art as an investment were cautious to preserve the traditional role of the artist. They maintained and even amplified the classical distinction I mentioned in the introduction between what happens on the market and what happens in the studio. Uh, next slide. For instance, in his book, Art as an Investment, published in 1965, Forrest Wagenthur insisted that, I quote, to understand the nature of the work of art, one must penetrate the sphere of the free, of the non-utilitarian. The production of the artist is in itself in no way dependent on the market. On this point, this type of producer is the opposite of the manager, who always knows what the others want and need and orientates itself, himself accordingly. Now, this is precisely what the concerned party, so artists, would come to contradict. Among artists, discussions about value and price of works of art took on an unprecedented topicality in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, next slide. The financialization of the art market was some of the most discussed themes by the Art Workers Coalition, for instance, so this is an association of artists, critics, and museum staffs who uh, was very active in defense of artists' rights uh, in the US around 1970. Among a collection of documents uh, published by the Art Workers Coalition in 1969, we can readily recognize here at the, at the bottom of, um, of this page um, the typical graphics assimilating the performance of impressionist painters to financial stocks. So this was very much in their mind at the time. Uh, next slide, please. Artists addressed this issue in numerous articles, essays, and in, in, in interviews, um, both with a positive and a normative approach. How should prices of works of art be determined? Thus asked the artist Ian Byrne, in an article entitled Pricing Work of Art, published in 1975. And I think you have to uh, push the next slide so that um, what I'm quoting here, yeah, enlightened. And uh, you can uh, press once again for the next quote. Thank you. So how should prices of work of art be determined? Before trying to answer that, we need some sort of, of an answer to how prices of works of art are currently determined, uh, Ian Byrne writes. If this debate should obviously be contextualized in the broader framework of the strong politicization of uh, artists of this period, their arguments should not be reduced to a simple anti-capitalist posture. They demonstrate a fine mastery of the state of knowledge on the art market at the time. Thus, Ian Byrne frames his analysis in the formation of art prices within a reflection, of, uh, on, within a reflection on, uh, artistic property rights. He writes, he writes, what is it we're selling when we sell something as a work of art? This is a crucial point. We're selling a certain sort of right to particular property. Setting a price then becomes a way of setting a standard criterion for the allocation of those certain, right, certain rights to what those rights state is the work of art. Bringing this conventionalist approach onto the practical terrain of an artist trying to earn a living from his art, mm -hmm. Einberg continues, and we can press next. Um, this has an immediate effect of dividing up the arts according to their modes of marketing. How is this? Because works of fine art, 
that is to say painting, sculpture, etc., are only uh, the only parts of the arts which are directly susceptible to the private property system. The market defined split has overwhelming repercussions on the various classes of artists in the various fields of the arts. It determines how we get our incomes, which inversely has, a redefi uh, has redefined our concepts and methods of production. You don't sell property rights to novels, poems, music, and so on, at least not in anything like the way you sell property rights to a painting. Someone, somewhat like Kandinsky, uh, who I quoted earlier, Einburn does not reject the art market as a byproduct of capitalism or because arts should, by principle, escape any economic form. His main concern is rather the impact of the modes of valorization on creation itself. Uh, he writes, the, the market determines how we get our incomes, which inversely has redefined our concepts and methods of production. And I'm just repeating here. Um, so this has an impact on production itself. And this is a problem because the market, and specifically the secondary market, um, where prices and quotations are defined, uh, are beyond the reach of artists, whose role is essentially confined to the production economy, he writes. Uh, next. Don't artists have any say in the market? What needs emphasizing uh, here, sorry, is that the artist as a producer has a contract only in the production market. Once the work has been traded in that market, it is then in a strictly exchange market, a market where goods are simply exchanged and doesn't involve any production at all. This is how and where manipulation can and does occur. But the point which needs making strongly is the extent that manipulation in the exchange market determines the price set in the production market. Uh, and next, again, the artist is generally the victim of the very structure he or she is supporting. What the artist receives is determined by the production market, and the production market is determined by the exchange market. And the exchange market is subject to its own self-interest, to the whims and greed of the private, the corporate, and the state powers involved in art investment. So here in Burns words, we find clearly expressed the dichotomy I started with at the beginning of uh, my paper between creation or production of art on the one hand and the commerce of art on the other. Somewhat paradoxically, the development of artists' ratings, which transfers the price and thus the commodification from the artwork to the artist, seems to have excluded the artist evermore from the art market. The artist appears like a passive object of exchange rather than an active agent. This exclusion of the artist from the commodification of, this, of his product or her product is all the more problematic, Byrne explains, when uh, we consider the extent that manipulation in the exchange market determines the price set in the production market. That is to say, financial operations on the exchange market have a retroactive effect on creation itself. And Bern here, again, is in agreement with Kandinsky and in clear opposition with Karl uh, Wagenfuhr. Um, next, please. Um, and maybe next again, I think, the, yeah, the highlights. The whole problem being that on the levels discussed, it is impossible to distinguish our typical art language from outright market language. We are no longer able to talk about our art production independent of market coercion. The fusion is complete. Once this state of affairs is acknowledged, Byrne argues, the only thing artists can do is either passively endure a system that constrains their creation or decide to play the game of the market and to participate in the construction of their own and of other artists' ratings. He writes, a few artists have come to realize that the exchange market is the era of real manipulation and have joined in, buying back and trading their own and others' works 
and cash in, in on the resale profits. So the alternative propositions that I'm going to um, envision now uh, and that were elaborated by artists at the time consisted precisely in exploring the ways in which the economy of their production and the economy of exchange of their products could be articulated in a more satisfactory way. In other words, the way in which uh, artists could become fully actors of the constitution of prices and market conditions. Uh, next slide, please. In response to Ian Byrne, the artist Adrian Piper published another article published uh, the same year entitled A Proposal for Pricing Works of Art. Uh, next, please. Her preliminary hypothesis is that, uh, I quote, exchange value should be identical to production value, uh, which she identifies as the sum of the cost of materials and the cost of labor. She specifies that the latter should not exceed the wage level of any average civil servant. For Piper, the reason why uh, the cost of production should determine the exchange value of the work is because the economics of production determines at least in part, the aesthetic value. Uh, next, please. Um, although the translation of product value into aesthetic value cannot itself be computed on a, on a monetary basis, the aesthetic value of a work clearly has its prior uh, production or material history as a necessary component. Right. And next, um, this suggests the possibility of incorporating the computed production value of the work into the work itself. That is to say by inscribing it somewhere on the work. Uh, so inscribing the price somewhere on the work. It might, for instance, appear as part of the work or be added to the artist's signature, date of completion, or title of the work. Piper's proposal, as I already suggested, partakes in a broader effort by artists at the time to reduce the gap between the primary and the secondary market. Next slide, please. We can mention here um, the famous um, contract um, modeled by uh, the conceptual art dealer Seth Sigelab with the help of the lawyer uh, Robert Prochansky in 1971, um, and which is um, uh, entitled Reserved Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement. And this is on the, on, the, on the next slide, please. The contract meant to protect uh, the economic interests of the artists by ensuring, for example, that they would receive 15% uh, of any increase in the value of their works in future resales. But the contract also aimed to give them some uh, visibility and uh, some form of moral control over the subsequent reproductions, exhibitions, or restorations of their works. In many ways, this contract reflects a general attempt at the time to secure a place for the artist in the future reception, circulation, and exchanges of his or, of or, her, of his, sorry, or her uh, production. But here, instead of doing away with speculation altogether, the goal is rather to allow artists to have their shares of the benefits. Uh, next slide, please. These theoretical and legal propositions are in line with a profusion of practical experiments that were led throughout the 1960s and explored uh, alternative ways of pricing works of art. The most famous of these uh, experiments is probably that of the French artist Yves Klein, who in 1959 decided to sell invisible works, so that's works uh, he uh, called immaterial, for a certain weight of fine gold, according to a ritual procedure that integrated the sale of art within the work of art itself. The problem of pricing art, of selling art, traditionally considered external to creation itself, um, were here integrated into the very heart of artistic practice and its reflective power. 
Plan's ritual sale was meant to operate not only on the primary market, but on the resale market as well. The artist had uh, given considerable thought to the effects of speculation, which caused the price for a work suddenly to rise or fall. Uh, and if you uh, press the next slide, we will highlight um, the clause that he um, uh, introduced uh, in a box at uh, the bottom left of his receipts for um, his immaterial uh, artworks, providing that, I quote, this transferable zone, so um, the immaterial zone is the name for his uh, invisible artwork, uh, this transferable zone may be sold by its owner only at twice the amount of its initial purchase price. Klein ex expected that his works would change hands many times many times, and that future sales would be accompanied by a steady rise in price. He was perfectly conversant with the mechanisms of a market of supply and demand, and far from denying the reality of their operation, or somehow seeking to prevent it, he chose instead to manage them himself according to his own rule. Uh, that is to say, um, the evolution of price on the secondary market should be um, um, a geometric uh, um, rule. Next slide, please. In the same year, uh, in uh, 1959, um, the Italian artist Giuseppe Galizio endeavored to sell his abstract industrial painting, that's how he called them, uh, by the meter. His gallery in Turin was full of long rolls of painting 12, 15, or even 70 meters long, equipped with a pair of scissors and a wooden measuring stick, he sold the requested length of painted canvas with volume discount. Next slide, please. The idea found its way uh, to the United States a few years later. In 1970, Robert Morris created the Peripathetic Artist Guild which proposed to provide various artistic services for $25 an hour plus production and transport costs. Two years earlier, in 1978, uh, in 1958, sorry, Morris had already sold another work, uh, which you see on the right, um, uh, which resembles uh, land art in some ways, and he was selling his uh, this sculpture by the weight. Um, the price was uh, $4,080 for the whole work, or $3 per pound. Uh, next, please. Rather than a price per meter, per pound, or per hour, the artist Carl Henry, who was also associated with minimalism in the 1960s, made his prices a direct factor of the cost of materials. In 1967, he sold identical works of the same geometric format at prices which differed according to the market price of the raw materials um, that they were um, made from, aluminum, iron, zinc. Four years later, for his last exhibition at the Duane Gallery in New York, Carl Andre chose a different pricing system. And you, see, you can see it on the, on the right. The price of each work uh, was calculated as, I quote, 1% of the buyer's annual income. He thus moved away from a conception of value as intrinsic, based on the cost of material, to a conception of value as extrinsic, uh, relative to the various incomes of the collectors. Um, next, please. For his exhibition at the Galerie Givaudan in Paris in 1968, the artist we can, associated with the Marxist group Support Surface, transparently presented the details of his production costs to justify his prices. He added up the price of the materials and supplies, the cost of labor, taxes, and the percentage kept by the gallery to come up to a price that was presented as fair and transparent. It should be noted, however, that in so doing, he uh, distinguished between the price of manual labor which was calculated at uh, 30 francs per hour, and the price of intellectual labor, which is um, 
of the total five times higher and is not in any ways uh, explained or broken down. Uh, next slide, please. A final example uh, could be in Edward Kinhall's series of watercolors from 1969. These are almost monochrome watercolors in paper of fixed dimensions, which uh, bear uh, stenciled in the center the price at which they were to be exchanged. A price in dollar ranging from $1, $1 to uh, $10,000, or an, an object of barter. Um, next slide, please. So the um, photographs uh, of the opening that you can see on screen um, capture the playful spirit uh, in which buyers uh, came to the gallery with the objects of bar barter um, that were supposed to be exchanged against uh, King Hall's pictures. So you can see here um, um, a, a buyer presenting a brace, that's a tool for drilling holes in, in wood, um, in exchange for work uh, by King Hall's asking just uh, this thing. And um, on the other, other um, uh, side of the, of the photographs, um, the fashion designer Rudy Gernheich himself offering one of his dresses in exchange for uh, work by Kinholz asking for a uh, Rudy Gernheich original. The artist um, Edward Kinholz envisaged his watercolors not only as a practical attempt to rethink how the art market um, and more um, generally the um, monetary economy operates by uh, virtue of um, putting together a new experience of interacting with collectors. But he also saw these um, paintings as uh, having a form of theoretical innovation. Uh, next slide. Uh, and next again, sorry. What I have done, in effect, he explained, is to issue a kind of currency which is not dependent on the normal monetary system. As inflation goes up, it sweeps my money along and in a particular way appreciates it while devaluing the dollar, pound, mark, franc. As another artist, Larry Rivers, noted in connection with Kinhall's watercolors, the market tends to value all the works of a given series, comparable in, in respect of dimension, dimensions, concepts, material, and period, the market tends to, um, uh, to value them uh, at the highest price achieved by um, the, the, late, the, the latest piece uh, exchange. And indeed, this is the very principle um, underlining the assessment of an artist's quotation. Accordingly, uh, Larry Rivers continued, as um, the price continues to rise, all of those who purchase a painting in the series of watercolors uh, at lower price um, um, than, a, the, the, than the next one may expect to see their asset value uh, increase. Uh, Kinholz himself made the, much of the same argument in a 1974 essay. Uh, ne next slide, please. He wrote, anyone buying a piece in series, in the series, sorry, only risks one dollar as the previous buyer has just paid the same price minus one dollar the buyer before him the same price minus two dollars etc the series has a respectably broad base and does well in practice as well as in theory kinholz devised one final flourish he decided that the first and the last works of the series so for one dollar and for ten thousand dollars could only be sold together this, he observes, permits the purchaser of uh, $10,000 to immediately double his or her money, since the canvas acquired for $1 will henceforth be worth 10000 as well. In principle, then, such a sale should elevate, uh, I am quoting Kinholz here, should elevate all the money watercolors to the same price, regardless of the printed face value. So we see here that just like if Klaus, 
Edward Kinholt had a shrewd, intuitive understanding of how the art market worked. He was aware of the particular interests shown by collectors for the first and last pieces of a series. And he was aware as well of the mechanism of construction of Ori's ratings. Like Klein, Kinholt substituted for, um, uh, for, for this mechanism a new system, uh, this time um, fully under the artist's control. Kinholt's idea to inscribe the work's price directly on the watercolor. Um, in fact, um, making a work of art out of its own price may remind us of uh, Adrian Piper's proposal, which I quoted um, earlier in this paper. Um, next slide, please. Uh, remember that Adrian Piper said, um, this suggests the possibility of incorporating the computed production value of a work into the work itself by inscribing it somewhere on the work. It might, for example, appear as part of the work or be added to the artist's signature, date of completion, or title of the work. And the emphasis uh, is, is mine here. In this case, the material incorporation of the price uh, to the work of art itself is very literal. Even in the case of future resales, the price initially decided by the artist will stay inscribed at the heart of the piece and will accompany it as an equal, even if it's resold at different and much higher prices in the future. In their book, Enrichment, a Critic of Commodities, Luc Boltanski and Arnaud Esqueré uh, argued that value should be defined as the critical form of prices as they are factually observed. In their view, when we are confronted with the price of a commodity, we tend to compare it with, with uh, what they call meta prices. That is to say, alternative, past, or even fictional prices of the same commodity. This comparison between the price as it actually appears and um, all these meta prices, what the price could have been according to the meta prices, is what allows the criticism of prices. If we follow their argument, what appears on Kinhall's watercolors are in fact meta prices. They are a set of fictional and practical prices chosen by the artist who will operate as forms of criticism of the actual prices in the future life of these artworks in the regular market. Next slide, please. Thank you. So coming to my, to my final section now. There are cases when the question of price and value are even more firmly inscribed within the work of art itself. It is what I coined in an article I wrote some years ago, um, artistic shareholding experiment. By this, I meant um, artists of the late 1960s who elevated investment on the stock exchange to the status of art. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, coming back. Um, uh, thank you, sorry. So here are four examples of, uh, of these uh, artistic uh, shareholding experiments. Um, on the upper left hand, uh, of the slide, you see um, um, uh, a proposition by the artist Les Levine, um, Profit System 1, which consists of uh, press releases and advertisements published in newspapers and magazines that publicly announce the acquisition of 500 common shares of a company, Cassette Cartridge Corporation, um, for $2,375 in March 1969. And then a few months later, the sale of those same shares for uh, $7,481, uh, so a net profit of uh, 220%. Uh, on the uh, upper right uh, side, you see Robert Morris Money Project, also dated March 1969. Um, so in this project, and we will Come back to it. The artist offered his services as an investor to the Whitney Museum of American Art. 
the final profit of his initiatives or was to be shared between the museum and, his, and himself. Um, below, you see Dan Graham's income outflow piece, um, an unrealized project to place advertisements in newspapers and magazines about a public offering of shares uh, for himself as a company, Dan Graham Inc. And finally, um, on, the, on the left, Lilo Zano's investment piece, um, which was started in January 1969 and um, describes her act of investing um, a bit less than a um, thousand dollars in highly speculative warrants on the market. These examples of what I call artistic shareholding experiments represent a paradigmatic case of how artists reacted to the rising financial logics of economics in general and of the economy of art in particular. At the moment when journalists, dealers and collectors treated art as an investment, artists made an investment um, uh, into an art. Earlier in this paper, I have shown how we can indirectly trace the passage of art as an investment from fiction to reality in the early and mid 20th century when quantitative tools were devised to allow a purely speculative approach to the art market. At this point, we can envision the reverse phenomenon when the reality of investment becomes the, the material for artistic representation. It's not, however, a pure re reversal from, you know, back uh, from fact to fiction, since the reality of the speculative act is essential to the very existence of the piece. Uh, next slide, please. So let me enter into one of these examples in a little bit more detail so as to make my argument clear. Robert Morris' work, Money, uh, comprises of a total of 16 documents, letters, promissory notes, a certificate of deposit, and receipts, retracing the artist's attempt to act as an investor on behalf of the Whitney Museum of American Art. The project was envisioned as a contribution to the group exhibition um, Anti-Illusion Procedures Materials, curated by the artist Marcia Tucker and James Monte in May 1969. Uh, next slide, please. And I think um, next again, so that we have the highlight. Perfect, thank you. In his initial proposal, dated March 1969, Robert Morris wrote, I quote, the museum should acquire a hundred thousand dollars by obtaining a loan against its collection or real estate holding. The sum is to be invested for the duration of the exhibition. An effort should be made to achieve a profit over the cost of the short term loan. After brokered fees, the profit would be divided between the museum and myself. And surprisingly, the museum uh, refused to expose itself to a risk of this magnitude, and the project was considerably revised, as evidenced by the exchange of letters and documents that followed and subsequently were collected in money. And we can press next slide, yes. Thank you. On the suggestion of the curators, the museum borrowed uh, $50,000 at a rate of interest of 5% from Howard Lipman, uh, a patron of the Whitney Museum and for many years a collector of Robert Morris' work. This sum was then invested for the duration of the exhibition in low-risk certificates of deposit, paying 5% interest, um, producing the sterile uh, results of a self-canceling transaction that generated a paper trail, but no real profit. It was perhaps in order to alleviate a lingering sense of frustration that uh, Lipman decided to donate the interest that was due to him, um, uh, $328, to the museum. 40 years later, Robert Morris was still asking for half of this sum, which the artist said was never returned back to him. Discussing the work in an interview several days before the opening, Morris directly associated his purpose with the question of art as an investment. And we can press next and, uh, and next again, I think. 
Thank you. If the Whitney Museum had agreed to borrow the $100,000 as originally requested, he explained, I could have taken the money and probably doubled it by giving it to particularly shrewd art dealers to buy modern art and sell it very fast. In answer to one of my questions a uh, few years ago, Robert Morris acknowledged that he had been influenced by the first art investment funds, which were then awaiting final approval from the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the US. Although they promised to encourage and financially support contemporary art by buying works of, uh, by leaving artists, these art funds aroused uh, skepticism and mistrust within the artistic community uh, as new actors and promoters of art as an investment. And as such, they were very much discussed by the artistic sphere of the time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in a sense, uh, with this work, Maurice proved typical of the attitude denounced by Ian Byrne uh, in the article that I quoted in Lance uh, earlier in this paper. Um, and next again, please. Um, Ian Byrne was writing, remember, a few artists have come to realize that the exchange market is the area of real manipulation and have joined in buying back and trading their own and others work and cashing in on the resale profits. So in a sense, that's exactly what's going on here. Morris demanded half of the profits earned by the witness investment during the course of the exhibition. Uh, and he sought to participate in any financial gains subsequently realized on the art market. Though he was not able to use the borrowed money as he imagined, his insistence on getting back half of the meager benefits made with money recalls the attempt of uh, Sigelaub's contract to associate artists to part of the profits made on the resale of their works. Morris thus positions himself as an artist who masters the financial logics of the market and makes sure to put them at his service rather than the reverse. However, this interpretation is contradicted by an important point. Money, as a work about, about investment and speculation, is itself outside the scope of investment and speculation. Um, it is what was uh, called at the time a process piece, the record of a performance, so to speak. And the resulting documentation has remained in the collection of the Whitney Museum ever since. Um, it was never uh, bought or sold. In fact, this work rests on an economy of art which is different from the art market, private patronage. Let's not forget that the piece owed its very existence to the financial support of Howard Lippmann, who uh, accepted to lend the $50,000 to uh, get the piece started. At the moment he was creating money, Robert Morris appears to be sympathetic to the view that conceptual art was a means of breaking free from the constraints of uh, the traditional art market and its obsession with objects. Um, next slide, please. And next again, sorry. He, he said to an interviewer, you could overemphasize that, but I think it's undeni undeniably there in my work, that resistance to art as a commu commodity. And next. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I mean art that remains an object is and is put uh, in the marketplace is the most amiable kind of capitulation to capitalism. And when the interviewer asked how art should be financed in the future, Morris recommended a greater reliance on the generosity of wealthy patrons. He said they are ready to forego an investment kind of value in supporting art that doesn't produce objects, but they certainly get the prestige kind uh, of return. And indeed, there is some evidence that the prospects of escaping the usual market mechanisms may well have held a certain appeal for prominent collectors. Robert Skull, for instance, who um, sponsored many land art projects 
uh, after he was a, um, a famous collector of pop art, uh, confided in a November 1970 interview. Uh, it's on the next slide. Oh, sorry, next again. Thank you. My present involvement with non-syllable or non-ownable art may be a manifestation of my need to get into art with profitless possibilities. I think I need to, uh, I think I needed to restore my essential gratitude for an artist allowing me to be part, uh, to become part of his creative process. Now it is pure and it has the least to do with the money value of a work of art. It is an affirmative involvement in what I hope will be the development of a man and his work. Uh, next slide, please. The idea that conceptual art was able to attract financing um, because it did more to satisfy an appetite for social prestige than a desire for monetary gain is strikingly confirmed in the case of Robert Morris's money, which was charitably supported by Howard Lippmann in exchange for his name appearing on the documents constitutive of the piece, which were exhibited at the Whitney Museum of Art. Let me now conclude with some final remarks. My paper has follow followed along the line of thought that Ian Byrne uh, expressed in these terms, and I'm quoting again um, on, the, on the next slide. On the levels discussed, it is impossible to distinguish our typical art language from outright market language. We are no longer able to talk about art production independent of market coercion. The fusion is complete. We have seen this fusion in the most literal form. Uh, next slide. When artists integrated price, sale, and future resales in the work of art itself, Next slide. We have seen it uh, when they made a work of art out of its own price. Next slide. And we have seen this fusion when they made speculation the very substance of the work itself. In many ways, of course, these are limit cases. One may even dismiss them as anecdotal experiments which never significantly affected the logics of the contemporary art market as a whole. After all, as uh, the artist Alan Capro noted in 1964, a picture never changed the price of eggs. However, these uh, limit cases seem to me to have a true heuristic value in that they stage in a reflective and explicit way something that is present but less visible in any artwork at any time. And that is the fact that artists integrate in their creation the criteria of valorization and the financial operations to which their works are to be submitted. In other words, what, happen, what happens downstream in the market has re retroactive consequences upstream in production. This feedback loop must be taken in consideration when we elaborate our own methodologies. And in a way, this is a plea for interdisciplinary conferences like this one, where market mechanisms and artistic logics can be studied together. And I've got you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Natalie is going to lead the discussion, first with people from the workshop, and then I'll be taking the questions from the YouTube Live.
So Charlotte has a question. Yes, Charlotte, thank you. Please go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. This was fascinating. Um, my question is, what do you make of the NFT craze uh, uh, that has uh, swept the, the world recently uh, in the line of everything you've, you've mentioned? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is an excellent question. I, th I think it's totally um, in line with what I've discussed today. And I think um, actually um, people often fail to see the uh, to see this as a historical phenomena, in fact, and uh, they see it as something that is brand new, when in fact it's it's only the heir to this, um, uh, first of all, to this uh, uh, way of uh, certifying um, uh, artworks uh, that can um, be sold with difficulty uh, if we don't have that kind of certification, uh, first of all. And, um, and secondly, it's also a very good example where um, the, the way of uh, certifying, which could only be a market tool, in fact, and could uh, be imagined to have no effect on the creation of the work itself, in fact, has an impact on, on creation. So it's a very good example of how um, the financial devices that govern the selling of a work can impact uh, creation and the very nature of the work. And uh, although we see it quite clearly with this recent example, it has a whole history um, that goes, you know, decades back. And that's also what uh, got me interested in, the, in this whole uh, history. Paul Melton had a question. Yeah, uh, thank you again for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, one question I had was to what degree, I mean, so thinking about the sociological li literature that you mentioned, um, you know, and around that same time, this is when Becker was developing this theory of human capital, right? And so I, I was curious to what degree you feel like that discourse within economics as human capital and, and you know, the individual as a kind of self-investing subject mm -hmm. um, comes into play or, or whether there was any sort of exchange between the artistic community and, and that sort of discourse and then the sociological or economic discourse rather mm. of the time. Thank you. Yes, I think this is, um, well, this, this is very um, pertinent to me. Um, they were indeed uh, uh, forms of parallel thinking uh, between the, um, the academic sphere and especially in, in, the, in the field of sociology and what happened uh, in the artistic sphere. Um, some sociologists were very widely read by uh, contemporary artists of the time. Um, a good example is, um, uh, for instance, the French uh, painter Jean Dubuffet, who uh, read very avidly uh, the first writings on the art market by Raymond Moulin. He was a very avid reader of her work, and he, uh, um, in 1968, he would just put up his phone and, and call her uh, for uh, a meeting with her and, and being able to, to discuss what her findings uh, in comparison with his own perception of the of the facts and um, and, and yes Bourdieu he also was was uh, was read so it, it definitely evolved together and I, I found it quite interesting also in methodological terms in in um, in the sense that um, when you are working on the art market as a researcher as an analyst um, uh, artists are following what you're doing and they're reacting to it. So in a sense, your subject of study uh, is evolving as your own tools of, of study are evolving. So it's uh, uh, it's something that yeah we should bear in mind. Fantastic. And then one thing, I, and this is more just a comment. Uh, you mentioned enrichment um, in terms of uh, the recent literature that relevant to this project. Another book um, I'll post here is uh, uh, Michel Fair's uh, rated agencies, um, which develops an, an argument in that regard that might be of interest to you. I'll, I'll post the link in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be glad. Thank you. Uh, Sui Huang, you had a question for uh, Sophie? Yes. Thank you, Sophie, for this wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to invite you to briefly comment on the contextual background of the financial market in the 1960s, um, as in what was the correlation between this boom in seeing art as investment and artistic shareholding experiments in um, um, conceptual arts in the 1960s with correlated to what was happening in the finance market in the 60s? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, this is very much connected. So there, um, I, I, what I like about the art market is that um, it relates to the creation of art, but it also relates to larger economic phenomena. So in a way, it's like a, a connecting point between the artwork and you know society and economy in general. And um, and in and in this case, it is um, uh, it is important to see it like that. Um, what happened uh, in the 1960s, as is well known, is uh, a, a very important art market boom, which interestingly started uh, rather with uh, old masters, in fact, but then um, also affected contemporary creation uh, over the, 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 the course of the 1960s. And in parallel, what happened was also a big change in the financialization of um, uh, of markets uh, in general, like outside the, the, the art market. And um, uh, the uh, big changes that were affecting, uh, especially the New York Stock Exchange at the time, um, uh, changes that had to do with, uh, well, economic changes, but also technological changes. Uh, the first computers were bought. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, something that uh, really amazed me because um, to, to realize how much the, 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 the New York Stock Exchange was very uh, uh, artisanal still until the very end of the 1960s. And, and, and these changed dramatically around 1968, 69. And this is really the date when these works are, are made. So it means they do not only react to what happens on the art market, they also react to um, a general cultural change uh, about finance in general, about the stock exchange, about how it, it is advert um, advertised in the general press. And um, it's also the image of finance that is reflected uh, in these works, I think. Many thanks. Okay, we had one last question by Christine Sumero. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sophie, for this great presentation. I have uh, uh, many, many comments or things that I would like to discuss with you, but maybe just one. Um, I was a very also, amongst other things, very interested in what you said about Giuseppe uh, Galizio in, in Turin. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about his um, approach to industrial produced art, um, this is the um, mass production, potentially mass consumption, if you would see any connection at all, uh, and that, that's Italy, um, early 60s, late 50s, uh, and Turin, in, uh, which is the fiat uh, city, of course, is uh, something as a particular history in terms of mass production in Italy. Um, is there any potential link that you can make with, I don't know, Hearst or Coombs in terms of this, this, this or is it totally far-fetched? Uh, I was just interested in, in knowing what you think. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, um, yes, Galizio was uh, a founding member of the Internationale Situationist, uh, which is this uh, leftist group of artists and, and, and uh, uh, activists uh, at, at this period. Uh, so, um, and his um, assimilation with, you know, the figure of the worker is very much uh, to be understood in that, uh, in that context. Uh, yes, the link with the um, uh, industrial uh, milieu of the Turin area uh, at this period is completely um, uh, um, um, is, is completely voluntary on the on the part of this uh, artist. Uh, in fact, he was uh, very much influenced also by the the fabrics industry, which was very active uh, in Turin at the time. And he would um, take his uh, huge rolls of uh, canvas from these uh, industrial fabrics. Uh, so it is a, a really um, a way of inserting himself in this economic um, uh, background. And um, so he uh, liked to uh, present himself as a mass producer, uh, producing into, uh, industrial paintings. Uh, so lots of quantities. He insisted on the fact that what his enemy was rarity and um, the elevation of prices through rarity. and. Uh, but the, the, it's interesting to confront that uh, to the reality of the production, which was actually quite slow, very manual. Um, he had only one assistant to help or two, but 
uh, it was something in fact in, on a very small scale, but he would try to um, uh, not show that and, in, and instead present himself as, as a mass producer uh, able to, to, um, uh, to produce also for a mass audience. And the, the link with uh, something like Hearst or Kunz is also very interesting to me because um, I think these are two sides of the same coin. Like when, um, uh, let's say the democratization of art and the commodification of art, it's just, um, uh, they go together. Uh, as soon as you decide to, um, to go away from an elite market based on rarity, um, you, on, on, on the one hand, you can address a wider audience and hope to reach them. Uh, and on the other hand, you risk to just um, uh, assimilate uh, the artwork to any kind of commodity, mass produced commodity. And this is really the, um, I think the, the problem that the Situationist International faced at this point. And this is uh, part of the reason why they decided to, to stop doing art altogether, because they, they couldn't really move out of this uh, contradiction, I think. All right. Um, Thank you very much for uh, everyone on the YouTube live. I remind you that if you want to ask a question, you just need to register and drop it into the YouTube live chat um, and we will relay your questions to the speakers. Um, we cannot see how many people are on the YouTube live. We know that 250 people registered, but we can't see you. So please um, do like our video, the YouTube live uh, financial structure and practices so that we see how many people, um, how many of you are out there. We're going to be taking a short break, um, the coffee break, um, very much needed for the speaker especially, and then uh, which we really thank. Thank you, Sophie. Thank um, you. And we'll be coming back for the next session, session one, privatization and financialization of art. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, this is our first session. Uh, of the financial structures and practices on the art market. Um, the session is called Privatization and Financialization of Art. And we have the pleasure of hearing first Enrique Grimaldi Figueredo, who is going to um, share his screen now. You have all the conference information, the abstracts and the bios in the conference package that was sent to you if you registered. Um, so Enrique? You can go. Okay. Could you see my presentation, Professor? It's perfect, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Professor Miyamoto, for the introduction. Uh, this paper converges one of alternative work in my doctoral thesis on the substantial role of great private collectors in the field of contemporary art. Uh, among the many approaches we, with which I work, I brought today a brief study uh, on how changes in public policies for the arts can lead to structural changes in different social spaces of art. Before starting the composition of our timeline of public policies for culture in France, it's important to indicate the context in which this research is inserted. First of all, it should be noted that this research is, is at the center of the debates and intrinsic differences between globalization and internationalization. Um, it's uh, translated for the word mondialisation in Portuguese and mondialisation in French. For the Brazilian sociologist Renato Ortiz, the relation between the distribution of capital and the political power of culture is, in the, in the globalised context, under a regime of complementarity but not simultaneity. That is, economics and culture are fields that react differently to globalisation. If economy, communication and technology can be, in fact, understood at a global level, 
teacher must be understood at the level of internationalization. In this sense, two concepts created by the sociologists help us to understand these differences, standard and pattern. Standard is associated with the process of serialization of cultural goods, while the patterns correspond to the set of structuralizing norms of, so of, soci of, of social relations, hierarchizing and legitimizing some standards to the detriment of others. Such movement could correspond to what so, uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu defined as the production of belief, la production de la croyance. Focusing on the universe of artistic production from this perspective is evident the constitution of a discursive hierarchy and the creation effort of narratives and conditions of arbitration on the art of quality. In this sense, whoever controls the patterns controls the disposition and legitimation process of the art. <clears throat> the stability of the structure of the art field has undergone some transformation since the 80s, especially with the globalization of markets and the financialization of culture, whose uh, one of the consequences is the uh, emergency of billionaires and millionaires willing to invest in art. Uh, Professor Nathalie Moreau shows us that if in 1987 there were uh, 100 39 billionaires in the world. In 2010, that number jumps to 2,208, many of which have large art, co art collections and an intimate relationship with the institutional field of art. Among these collectors, one, one group becomes sociologically interesting for us. Thus, that Moulin Kaos mega collectors and Professor Moreau describe as great collectors of contemporary art. These few collectors, mostly from the corporate world, appropriated tools that were previously exclusive to the institutional field of art. They create private museums, make donations to public museums, participate in, in curator boards of different uh, and international, international, internationalized museums, are shady holders in auction houses as Chris and Philips, uh, sponsor catalogues and exhibitions. <clears throat> In this sense, they are responsible for producing what Nathalie Moreau calls small historical events, that is, objectified signs of belief that help the artist to consecrate and enter the history of art. In this sense, whoever dominates the resources for promoting of small historical events also dominates the symbolic capital on art, that is, the ability to initiate or stop processes of social recognition of, of art, as indicated by Diana Crane, or even the artification of art, as indicated by Nathalie Reinich and Roberta Chapiro. The difference between regular collectors and these few mega collectors actively participate in the field of art is the category of agent, this category of agents, the mega collectors, sometimes manages to convert the accumulated economic and social capital into artistic capital. This happens in a number, in a different number of ways, and it's a phenomenon that became more relevant with the decrease in state support of the, of, for the arts. Competition, in this sense, is unfair. Take, for example, the case of Ukrainian collector Viktor Pinchuk. <clears throat> In 2011, and only in London Gallery White Cube, he spent around $108 million. In the same year, Tate's acquisition budget was no more than £3.9 million. This type of situation makes public institutional increasingly vulnerable to the action of the private capital and a symbolic encirclement by it. For the, from this theoretical angle, we can ask the following question. How does this relate to the French case? Shintao Wu has already shown in 2006 that the privatization of culture is a reality in Anglophone countries, especially in the USA and the United Kingdom, uh, since the Reagan and Tart governments. In these countries, a neoliberal turn has ensured the substantial inflow of private capital into the field of art, so that some museums and public galleries currently have most of their budgets dependent on donations from these patents. In France, the situation is different, partly because of the constant presence of intellectuals in public cultural debate, but also 
because of the notion brought by the fourth French Republic that sees culture as an uh, universal good, uh, the, the sense of a welfare state. However, the situation has been changing since the turn of the millennium. When we think about public policies for culture and the arts in France, it is, is it interesting uh, the possibility to divide these experiences into at least three phases of intervention. A first phase from the foundation of the Ministère de la Culture in uh, 59 to the end of the 60s, a second phase in the 70s and 80s, and a third phase in the 90s and 2000s. <clears throat> In each of these phases, there are certain policies that deserve to be highlighted, as well as certain administrations that have been become representative. Of course, the evolution of public policies is something quite complex and full of nuances. However, regarding the presentation of this paper, we will illustrate each of these phases by three ministers, André Moreau, Jacques Lang, and Jean-Jacques Alago. The 60s were marked by the welfare state and an idea of cultural democracy. It was decided that the Ministère de la Culture had the, mission, uh, had the mission of making the main works of humanity and first of France uh, accessible to as many French people as possible and ensuring the widest audience for cultural heritage. Two policies come together to materialize this desire making all citizens reach the works of culture and extending the benefits of social protection to artists. Furthermore, cultural policies place it at the forefront of the logical modernization brought by the Gaullistic Republic. The state must represent an engine of creation and regulation of culture. The use of plants from 59 onwards participates in this logic. The evolution for the fourth plan in 61 to the 60th plan in 70, gradually ratifies a vast coherent project, which encompasses and later sur surpasses Moho's almost mystical vision. At this moment, there is an effort for cultural democracy materialized in the Maison de la Culture, under the responsibility of Guéton Picon, uh, at the time General Director of Arts and Letters. <clears throat> at the same time, the idealization of great works of humanity that would make cultural provincialism retreat lead to different criticisms regarding the elitism and the Moreau's administration about the elitism in Moreau, uh, managing the Minister of Culture, uh, is the 67 text by Jacques Charpentreau, Pour une politique culturelle. At the 70s and 80s, but especially at the 80s under the administration of Jack Lang, they are intended to rethink cultural democracy and propose as an alternative its more anthropological aspect, the cultural democratization. Democratization was based on an understanding of cultural diversity, the coming uh, to power of the left um, with François Mitterrand in 81, led to a triple break the organization and function of the Ministère de la Culture. Essential is the quantitative break that was reflected in 82 by the doubling of the Ministère de la Culture budget. Although this expansion of cultural field has mainly attracted the attention of specialized groups, the association between culture and economy is also central in this period. The support given to cultural industries make cultural policy converge with economic policy. We could uh, also highlight the first turning in relation to the entry of private capital into the artistic scene uh, through the ADMICAL, Association pour le, pour le Développement du Mécénat Industriel et Commercial. So, although the idea of cultural diversity was a maxim, the ministry's approach to cultural industries became, became a quite characteristic. In the 90s, <clears throat> There was a failed attempt to refund the ministry, La Refundation, uh, which started with the dissolution of the assembly in 97. The late 90s and the early 2000s were marked by a turn in governmental dispositions. 
cultural decentralization conceived as a way to expand the paradigms of cultural democracy and cultural diversity actually contributed to a substantial approximation with the, with the private sector. The ministerial mandates of the early 2000s, particularly those of Catherine Itasca, uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Alagon, demonstrated great permissiveness with private sponsorship as a way of providing budgetary and administrative autonomy to large cultural facilities, both museums and art institutions, a level, min, uh, municipal level and a federal level. The laws passed in July 4th and December 17 of 2002 provide, in this sense, the legislative tools that allow the, the great patrons approach to the public spheres of culture. No wonder we see the flourish of large collections and private foundations in France, especially in Paris, and a more significant approximation of corporate patrons and private collectors with public institutions. Fondation Solomon uh, opened in, in June 2001. In 2004, we had the opening of the Foundation Antoine de Galbert, La Maison Rouge. Uh, Fondation Louis Vuitton was created at Bois de Boulogne. And Pinot Collection, due to a more promising legislative scenario, opened ice space in Paris in 2021 after 15 years in Venice. In this context, we can ask ourselves what are the possible consequences of a corporate entry into the arts? <clears throat> Through a quantitative and qualitative survey of corporate collections in Paris, we can make some notes. First, these institutions are able to create and coordinate the small historical events necessary for entry of artists into history of art. In this case, we see a topological study of this. The red spots are the artists who always receive the greatest symbolic and material investment by the collections. They participate in many group exhibitions, individual exhibitions, and have edited catalogues about their work. The lighter rose spots and yellow spots receive it, in the sense, less investment. The lines between them vary according to codes and correlations between the artists and the promoted by these collectors. When grouped together, you realize that this that have uh, established uh, artists just recognize this not only artificially increases the cultural relevance of the collection, but in certain cases, it also helps to increase its, its financial value. From this perspective, these collectors would be collaborating with certain narratives in art. That, that is the, the, the central problem of that. Uh, to conclude, the study of the evolution of public policies for the arts thus becomes not only an object of historical or sociological interest, but a, para a paradigmatic way of understanding future possibilities for the art world. It is, it is still possible for us to provoke. If private patronage tends to become a new norm in France, for example, what can we expect from the art of the future? Would, be, would we be facing an imposition of creativeness through the constitution of specific and monopolized rules by a few agents and institutions? It's on this theme that I intended to dedicate of my thesis. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Henrique, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we will be taking questions both from the YouTube and from the workshop audience in, in the meet um, after the other two presentations. Um, so I have the honor to introduce uh, Christine Zumello. I remind everyone you have the bios in the conference pack. Um, she is going to talk to us about corporatization and monetization of art in the United States. She may 
20 years. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. There's always a little bit of suspense when that happens. Be careful that the four uh, sheets don't rub on yes. the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benedict. And is it working? It's working. Yes, you can start it. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, first, of course, thank the organizers of this workshop, um, Benedicta Diana, Nathalie and uh, Elisabetta. Um, for the scope of today's presentation, I'm going to show you and, and, and give you an abridged uh, version, a few highlights of my, of my talk, of my presentation on this very broad um, theme of corporatization and monetization of art in the US. And I'm going to say a few words about what I mean, what is meant by uh, hard and uh, soft. So um, I look up, what I want to do uh, for the 20 minutes is uh, take a closer look at um, art management and the financialization of non-financial assets. Uh, and in this particular case, um, works of art. So um, I'm going to first uh, say a few words about art as an asset class, as a, uh, a new asset class, and uh, see how we can build on um, the financial infrastructure uh, for, the, for that category to exist, or how uh, financial terms, uh, financial approaches have invested uh, art or are trying to invest art. And uh, it's not an easy um, feat for good and bad reasons. I'm also going to say a few words about um, what we can call the uh, art in a financial ecosystem. And I want to um, show you a couple of examples of art investment funds and also how art is um, now built into wealth management in a quote professional way. And I will end with uh, looking at some issues about valuation, liquidity, um, and take three examples which uh, try to show how um, uh, fund managers um, are trying to make the art market more liquid, uh, and I'm using inverted commas here, through securitization, art loans, and fractional uh, investments. Um, and I will end with questions of legitimacy and impact um, investing. So to start with, um, I uh, wanted to uh, come back on this very idea of so monetizing art or managing art, uh, and another way of putting up that is saying that uh, non-financial assets are financialized, so which seems to be a contradiction in terms, and we're going to try and see how that is reconciled. So art and money um, is, is definitely not, a, not at all a new association by all means, but the ascent of finance within capitalism to attain finance capitalism or the financialization of the economy has been a general movement whose debut um, uh, date is a matter of contention uh, among economic historians, art historians also, but which can be identified in the United States as coinciding with the early 1970s. And the financialization of the economy, which is the broader context in which I'm talking about the financialization of the art market, the financialization of the economy is accompanied by a series of trends which have reached the art market also, uh, but not only. And I think that is uh, something that I wanted to, uh, to stress. So considering the theme of this workshop, uh, the frame of my talk today falls within the more general meaning of financialization of the economy and the financialization of art. Sorry, that's a very long word. Uh, is, uh, is one niche element uh, of that. So financialization can be seen as being the incursion of uh, financial vocabulary, financial techniques and approaches um, in the art market. And that is per se a new form of appropriation or finance is appropriating um, some aspects of the art uh, market. So if art can now be considered in some ways as a new financial asset class through the application and the inclusion of financial consideration um, in the art world, 
I want to look at how finance uh, is present in art today in the US in, in, in that twofold approach, which is two sides of the same coin. One is hard and quantitative, so art or hard or quantitative, and it's financial. And the other, which can be seen, deemed soft or more qualitative, uh, but the two coalesce um, uh, in the way art uh, is uh, being uh, approached. So as being an asset class means that uh, art or artworks, or some artworks, uh, is now a category or is seen as a category of investments which have similar characteristics to the common asset classes that everybody, everyone knows, for stocks, equities, uh, bonds, fixed income, um, real estate, commodities, or futures. So based on monetization strategies for fine arts, for fine arts, sorry, uh, it's just as the fact that um, finding that fine art, but not only um, fine art here, including uh, investment grade wine, uh, classic cars, uh, coins, for example, have become asset classes in their own right. And that means that they're seen as potentially being able to, I quote, unlock value. And this is a trend which is uh, ex expected to continue as big data uh, enables more, quote, potentially more accurate valuations of uh, these uh, holdings. So art uh, in this financial ecosystem means that a certain number of hard trends have been replacing passion and intuition connoisseur uh, in the art market by calculated, informed decision-making, assisted by increasingly abundant flows of information, increasingly sophisticated market devices, and I will show you a couple, and also new stocks of uh, knowledge. So this process in itself has uh, in involved a wide range of actors, um, so economists, um, funds, investment funds, but also auction data provider, providers, art market research companies, art appraisers, uh, legal services, insurance companies, and accountants in particular for tax purposes and inheritance uh, purposes. So art and artworks uh, traveling to the category of assets is a prerequisite for considering um, art as a professionally manageable category, and it opens the door to their consideration, in particular by uh, investment funds. Now, investment funds being uh, baskets of baskets or pools of uh, financial instruments, which are then cut up into shares in the fund and managed by a fund manager uh, with pre-tailored hedging approaches, depending on the level of risk that is associated with the fund. It is obviously, as a footnote, the most um, common and conservatively managed uh, investment funds in the US are called mutual funds. And then there's a very fine gradation of funds up to the riskiest ones, uh, but also the ones which potentially offer, offer the highest return, uh, hedge funds. And art funds uh, are in between one and the other mutual funds and uh, hedge funds, and it's still very difficult. And this is one of the issues that I want to mention towards the end of my talk today. It's very difficult to assess the risk uh, involved uh, in um, art uh, funds. So investment funds, uh, uh, as far as art is concerned, have been uh, treated or have been considered, uh, and I'm giving you two examples here, uh, as part of wealth management. So uh, the private banks of JP Morgan, the private part of JP Morgan, private bank part of JP Morgan, wealth management uh, is asking, do you think of your art collection as a financial asset? Uh, CT, uh, private bank is also, uh, has had and is developing an art and advisory financing. Uh, and as you see from uh, their uh, home, home webpage site, it says that what they're looking for is achieving liquidity from artworks. So one of the major mantras of portfolio management, of fund management, is diversification. And diversification, as far as art is concerned, or art funds, or funds which include a certain amount of works of art, uh, is now considered as a holistic 
uh, wealth management technique for high net worth uh, individuals, HNW. So it means that art and collectibles are part of the services offered by portfolio managers, in particular private banks, family offices, and the aim being to bring works of art in the same category as financial assets, and not just as marginal fringe element, uh, which might or might not uh, be, be valued as part uh, of a portfolio. In 2019, about 52% of collectors said that portfolio diversification was a strong, very strong motivation for buying art, and that is up from 36% in 2017. We're obviously waiting to see what is happening, what will happen after the pandemic. So the rise in art market sales and prices um, paradoxically can sometimes be viewed with suspicion and um, professionals are not pre prepared and banks, uh, private banks also, not necessarily prepared to change and adapt their strategy according to these markets trends. Secondly, uh, there is a lack of understanding and knowledge about the art market and how to respond to rising uh, art uh, valuations. So some of the issues around art advisory, art financing, wealth, uh, holistic wealth management and including art uh, are uh, issues around low transparency, unregulated nature of the market, and that will be also mentioned in other talks during this workshop, lack of internal expertise, and also sometimes the difficulty in measuring uh, benefits. Another major area of uh, concern uh, is that of liquidity. And from an investment perspective, so from a monetary perspective, uh, is the, 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 the matter of contention, a major issue is the potential lack of liquidity of a work of art. So acquiring a work with value, uh, which might not be easily be saleable, or resaleable in the secondary market, uh, and thus would freeze its intrinsic value and bind it to the risk of not being able to sell when needed. And that potentially is obviously a loss of value on the secondary uh, market. So there's several ways in which um, this aspect, this potential lack of liquidity has been addressed by uh, professional uh, by managers and uh, financial managers, and one of which is securitization. The second one that we will talk about is art loan, and the third one is fractional investments. <clears throat> so securitization was a, a very common, uh, now a very, very common uh, uh, financial technique, which whose purpose is to um, issue securities based on an asset, so ABS, asset-backed securities. Uh, I just wanted to uh, show you, uh, this is from the uh, CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, is the homepage that I took uh, this week. Um, and the CME as a um, futures and options market in Chicago. It's one of the biggest uh, in, in the world. And this is the list of um, products that they have. So basically what the CME does is sell contracts on agricultural product, energy, equity indexes, ethics, foreign exchange, interest rates, metals, and options. And each of these categories are subcategories, agriculture, grains, oil, seed, livestock, dairy, fertilizer. And then you have the contracts to the right. Um, so corn futures, uh, wheat futures, soybean futures. So this is the huge, enormous, very installed, very uh, regulated matrix of futures of securitized um, uh, contracts, financial and commodity products that are bought and sold um, uh, every day, mostly on, in Chicago and New York on the NYMEX. And um, I wanted to show artworks are still not part of this huge, enormous infrastructure, uh, but there is um, a trend, a sort of what can sometimes be called a sort of exotic trend uh, of um, securitizing assets, so which is not only the case for artworks and this is i just wanted to show you what is traded on the cme weather futures so there are contracts which are uh, sold uh, contracts about uh, you see that there's sample cities in the us and there's contracts that are sold uh, about uh, heating days uh, rising temperature days hdd or cooling days and cdd so what uh, security securitizing art is trying to do not yet, of course, on the CME, but it's trying to 
um, mimic is trying to uh, draw uh, from that uh, technique. Uh, so Griffin Art Partners is uh, securitizing um, artworks. Uh, and that is considered, so Griffin is basically uh, teaming up, um, it's based in Luxembourg, uh, at, um, Swiss Bank, uh, Royal Innovative Banking and Link Management. And they're trying to um, issue securities out of, or based, backed by uh, works of art. The second um, uh, element or the second possibility for uh, making um, works of art more liquid or the market for works of art more liquid is art loans. Uh, uh, this is an example for the fine art group, which you can easily find on the, on the internet and it tells you uh, exactly what uh, it does. Uh, Bank of America, private bank, also has uh, uh, this business, particular business where uh, they will use art as you as you can read, uh, use the art your own to borrow the funds you need, all without a single work uh, leaving uh, your uh, work. Um, another uh, example is um, that of fragmented ownership of works of art, uh, still with this idea of making them more marketable, more monetarily usable. Uh, and um, there's several um, online um, businesses that have been uh, created. Uh, so this is Masterworks founded in, like, in 2017. And it basically allows investors to buy shares of great masterpieces. And um, their first offering was an Andy Warhol's Marilyn painting, which was qualified by the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, in um, May of 2017. And uh, they began selling shares in that masterpiece uh, in June. So here you have a chart uh, that uh, is on the homepage where you see that they're comparing. Um, and it would be interesting to go a little deeper uh, into that. I don't have time now, but they're comparing themselves to uh, the S&P 500 uh, um, annualized return. Yes, the Standard & Poor's annualized return is one of the most common stock indexes in the US with uh, the Dow Jones. Um, so uh, another example that I wanted to show is Otis, uh, where again, they're buying and selling shares of collectibles, sneakers and uh, art. Uh, they have an app which, uh, through which you, with which you can trade 24 seven. Um, Messina's is another art investment uh, platform. And you can uh, build your own portfolio. So your own little investment fund basically of a tailor-made investment fund of uh, art, um, uh, art shares. Uh, Look Lateral uh, and, uh, is another website. And I just wanted to dwell maybe for, for 30 seconds on this roadshow of Look Lateral. So roadshow is a very common expression that is used in finance when a new financial instrument is put on the market, uh, is being sold or about to be sold or a new share or a new bond. There is a roadshow that is conducted by uh, uh, the salespeople, the professionals at, at, at banks or uh, uh, the underwriting banks of the issue. Uh, and this is very much the expression that is used by Luke um, Collateral. So this is 20, 2018, basically uh, all the venues uh, in which uh, Luke Collateral conducted their roadshow uh, in order to sell uh, basically um, what uh, they're doing in their uh, business. Another um, very recent um, creation is artsquare.io. So they're selling some key pairing, as you see to the right of the slide. Uh, and then um, uh, the Incontournable, uh, Damien Hurst, um, uh, which uh, you see here, artsquare.io. So um, these are, are examples very, very broadly, very briefly that I wanted to mention in this um, attempt, sometimes even maybe a desperate attempt to try and make uh, the market more liquid. Uh, what I would want to um, end uh, for today uh, are uh, questions or roads for uh, more, um, uh, I just can't, I, I, don't, I don't have time to go into deeper uh, details, but there's a, a very big questions in term, question in terms of the legitimacy of the financialization of art in both the art world um, and but also in the financial world okay, where 
uh, the issues of valuation, liquidity, standardization, regulations are uh, raising our eyebrows uh, in the financial community. A softer approach uh, to uh, art and money or art and finance um, is uh, what I call a softer approach uh, between inverted commas is um, trying to uh, value or to uh, give, um, uh, to underline impact, what is called impact investing in art uh, and culture. So client entertainment, uh, wealth managers are offering uh, many art-related tailor-made services, private viewings, visits to art fairs, museum exhibitions, uh, uh, and art collection management as a softer approach, but still always with this idea that it has some monetary value uh, in the end. And this is part of a growing transitional trend which hinges, which hinges around the client experience, a very soft management skill, uh, and leads to seeking more, I quote, emotional and personal connections between wealth managers and their clients. So the need to develop a client relationship model, uh, which is built around clients' interests, hobbies, and passions, is, has become an, an essential part of engaging with those individuals and trying to address uh, their needs in terms of either art needs, art purchases, but also art collection uh, management. So the idea, um, which sometimes can be seen um, or looked at with a, a certain amount of uh, suspicion and fear is that corporations, for, co for some corporations, art or even art institutions have become or are becoming PR public relations machines uh, that feed uh, into their CSR policy. Uh, to conclude um, very uh, briefly, I um, wanted, basically wanted to say four things as a conclusion. Um, first, that uh, there are, we're witnessing what I call uh, the building of a financial polder uh, in art. Um, and also, um, uh, and, and those two trends go hand in hand, what Saskia Sassen has uh, used uh, to describe the financialization of the economy, uh, the fact that finance has an extractive function and that finance is also doing some extractive work. Um, and some would say, obviously, some destructive work uh, in uh, the art world or the uh, art markets. Uh, third element in my um, conclusion, if we may call this a conclusion, is that rating agencies um, are for the moment still absent from the finalized, final, financialized art market, which some might see as a good sign given their latest uh, events, the latest events obscure, obscuring their role. But uh, rating agencies have initially uh, um, an information, an informational role and a liquidity uh, role uh, for the, uh, the financial markets notwithstanding, of course, all the scandals that everybody is aware of. Uh, so that is also a question mark for today's art market. What about art investment and uh, ratings? And the last uh, thing that I wanted to say to hint at in, in this uh, conclusion uh, is that the financialized art market remains to this day mostly an OTC market, an over-the-counter uh, market. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, a major challenge uh, for the uh, art market and its uh, monetization, but also maybe a, certain, a, a sort of safeguard for potential um, uh, generalized uh, abuse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, for this um, riveting investigation in the financialization of art. Um, without further ado, because we'll have time for questions, uh, I'd like to switch to, switch to Charlotte Gould, um, who's going to talk to us about buying art before it is made. Um, and she's going to talk to us about the British model of this um, practice. Thank you very much, Charlotte. We can see your screen, so you can go. Thank you, Benedict. Let me just launch my slides. Um, are you able to see the, the first title oh, slide? Perfect. perfect. Thanks very much. Oops, why is it moving on it? So, yeah. Sorry, just 
launching it again. Here it is. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the um, the UK. In the UK, uh, and since the late 20th century, both the state and private sponsors have been keen to support the commissioning of increasingly monumental, spectacular uh, mixed media artworks. Anish Kapoor's Artilometal Orbit uh, has been described as the tallest commission of public art in Britain. But Nicholas Sirota has also said that it's the greatest piece of patronage. It was unveiled in 2012 to coincide with the inauguration of the Olympic Village, and it um, exemplifies many of the novelties which have shaped the British art ecosystem since the early 80s. First, the abusive use of the word patronage to in fact refer to corporate sponsorship. Then the incorporation of the sponsor's name in the very title of the work. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, um, Chintao Wu has explained how the incorporation of sponsors' names in, um, uh, in the names of their, their brands um, uh, was something that uh, was meant to act as uh, um, uh, advertising. So um, you had the Barclays Young Artist Award, for example, or the uh, BP Portrait Award. Um, also the use of public art for urban regenerative purposes, Orbit put forward the redevelopment of the East of London in its intended legacy use. And finally, its monumental character and elaborate engineering, which required production funds to be invested ahead of the creation of the work, rather than down the line when it enters the market, uh, while relying on the emergence of complex public and private commissioning models. Besides some commissions originating from very wealthy individuals, uh, today's various commissioning models have become quite complex both practic practically and conceptually, relying on public and private partnerships and co-sponsoring. Many new parameters accompanied these new practices and aesthetic changes. The injection of uh, national lottery money into the art sector from 1993 under John Major, who did not share uh, Margaret Thatcher's qualms about state-sanctioned uh, gambling. The, the rise of foundations, which had gone hand in hand with the mounting number of very rich collectors and funders encouraged by uh, neoliberal tax incentives. Uh, see here, of course, the different finance acts of the 80s and uh, the introduction in particular of the uh, gift aid scheme. And uh, new mixed economy structures, which are able to harness both the stability of state funding and the seduction of art for private philanthropy. Typically, Nesta, uh, which was set up in 1998 with an endowment coming from lottery money and which um, ran the Innovation and Giving Fund, fund uh, was one of these new charities which aimed to encourage other charities to diversify their income in a creative manner. Uh, the adjective creative, which is often uh, used in this context, uh, points both to the novelty, of course, of the, the new modernized types of charitable contributions that it promotes, uh, but also to the challenging economic context, to say the least, from which uh, the need for them arose. The diversion by the Thatcher government of state funding distributed by the Arts Council since after the war uh, towards matching schemes and the encouragement of business sponsorship had broken with the welfare state consensus and transformed the national art ecosystem in the early 80s. Tax breaks were, of course, central to the shaping of this new uh, model. But she went further in 1984 by introducing the uh, business sponsorship incentive uh, scheme, the BSIS, patronized by um, uh, Prince Charles in, in a country in which meeting a royal is often reward enough for uh, giving. It offered to match with a public grant any money given to the arts by a business corporation, thus effectively conditioning state patronage to the securing of private patronage. 
Uh, Chin Tao Wu, again, uh, has explained how businesses were allowed to claim the benefits derived from this uh, extra state funding in terms of uh, publicity and recognition, making it a commercial deal, deal rather than um, actual philanthropy. So today I would like to draw from some conclusions uh, from two objects that I've studied at different times. Uh, from my recent research on art commissioning agencies, and in particular on London-based uh, Trust Art Angel, it's the very own, uh, presuming um, uh, office that I visited in, in, in London to uh, look into the archive. Uh, and from all the research that I'd uh, done on the YBA scene of the late uh, 80s to try and see links which might shed light on the uh, dramatic changes which occurred in the art sector in Britain from the 1980s and more specifically from 1985, which I'm going to use as something of a, a key uh, date here. When discussing the YBAs, the sensation exhibition comes to mind, of course, as a sort of apotheosis. It was marked, uh, marketed as a, a British revenge on half a century of American art market domination, especially when it traveled to uh, the uh, Brooklyn Museum in 1999. In fact, this was British collector Charles Saatchi's triumph, the presentation of his personal collection at the Royal Academy. And so the celebration of a private collection that she had started accumulating with his uh, first wife, uh, Doris, um, here in a portrait that they'd commissioned uh, from Maplethorpe, uh, after making his fortune in advertising and famously in political advertising for the Tories in particular, uh, thus attaching even more clearly his fortune to the Thatcher government. Uh, but see also, his um, uh, agency's ASCAF ad for the VNA, which uh, has itself become an exhibit. 1985 was the year Charles Saatchi opened uh, his own gallery on Boundary Road after the patrons of New Art debacle. Saatchi uh, had been part of this discrete group of British collectors within the Friends of the Tate scheme to assist in the acquisition of new work uh, as a reaction mostly to the infamous uh, BRICS scandal when the Tate was reproached with pen spending public money on Carl Andre's uh, equivalent seven, or as the tabloids uh, put it, a, a, a load of rubbish. Um, but when the Tate gallery then mounted um, a Gillian Schnabel e exhibit in 1983 with the private support of the patrons of New Art, the public was suddenly uh, made aware that Saatchi was himself a member of the group as well as a, a collector of the artists. So the uproar was this time created by the use of private money uh, to raise an, artist, an artist's profile and uh, give his body of work what uh, is called museum quality which might benefit the collector down the road. That was when Saatchi quit the PNA and decided to wield his artistic influence differently by creating his own uh, gallery with a very American industrial uh, look. After collecting all the big American names since Warhol, Saatchi had borne the brunt of the 1990 art market crash and had become interested in the much uh, cheaper young British artist whom he started uh, buying in bulk after visiting uh, Freeze in 1988. Freeze had been um, an artist curated exhibition in an old biscuit factory in the uh, Docklands that uh, Thatcher at the time was in the process of regenerating. And this was done at a time when uh, budget cuts were pushing artists to become in the Thatcherian uh, lingo entrepreneurial. Nine years later, Sensation celebrated Saatchi's uh, success in creating the movement of the decade, in giving it its name, and in putting Britain on the world art map. Uh, but while the exhibition was aggressively mar marketed by uh, Saatchi himself, but also by the uh, British Council uh, abroad as a British success over uh, American dominance, see the cues here in front of the Royal Academy. Um, I believe that it, it was in fact a demonstration of the prevalence of the US model, which had uh, taken over since 1980. 
uh, tax breaks for art giving, a new cultural policy of only matching public funding to private funding, uh, and the hybridization of art funding through sponsorship, uh, often described at the time as a, a Trojan horse for uh, museums. Not that uh, art sponsorship did not exist before uh, Thatcher uh, in Britain. Um, cigarette money was omnipresent on the 1960s uh, scene, for example. But this was taken to a whole other uh, level with BP, of course, uh, but also the uh, Sackler uh, family. So as I said, 1985 is a central date here in this um, um, in these changes, uh, because it was also the year David Harding was appointed head of the new environmental arts department at uh, Glasgow School of Art. Uh, and this department had a, a transdisciplinary approach focused on the context of the work rather than on its uh, medium or genre. And Harding was going to introduce a, a new relation to urban, but also uh, rural environments and transform public art in Britain probably paving the way for Britain's most famous examples of public art, of course, the Angel of the North, but also the many uh, Fourth Plinth commissions on Trafalgar Square. Um, but also many commissions by agencies pledging to bring art closer to the public and to presenting it in unexpected places, Art Angel's motto. Um, for example, in an empty uh, CNA store on um, Oxford Circus. The reason why the third instance in which 1985 can serve as a, a key date uh, in this um, demonstration is the fact that it also uh, is the date um, when Art Angel was uh, founded, one of Britain's major art commissioning agencies and a template for new possibilities. So London was finding um, a place at the center of an international art market boom in which art was becoming an asset uh, class, as uh, Christine has uh, just told us. And uh, in this context, art historian uh, Roger Took and his associate John Carson celebrated the surge of interest in contemporary art, but they also felt that it masked a dangerous downside to the risk that most art would now adapt to more commercial tastes and agendas. And so, they founded this charity as a privately funded initiative, and the first ever Art Angel exhibition happened in June 1985. It celebrated um, non commodifiable uh, public arts uh, and environmental art, in the case of Goldsworthy, or here with uh, Vera Frankel on the Technicolor in central London. Uh, they also exhibited the, the work of Barbara Kruger. This last work, a sign that inspiration was coming from American public art uh, um, in the beginning um, and um, influenced from what agencies were doing in New York at the time, creative time in particular, um, the people responsible for Carol Walker's a very famous uh, recent a subtlety um, and who had worked with uh, uh, Kruger in the, in the same way. Art Angel was very officially founded as a reaction to Thatcher's American-inspired cultural policies. Uh, and against the way someone like Saatchi profited from this new context to advance his own collection. Paradoxically, while it opposed the Tories' art cuts in its early days, uh, that is before it could apply for uh, Arts Council regular funding and become one of its uh, regularly funded organizations, it involved exclusively private backers. The trust uh, aimed to be experimental in the way it functioned, as well as in the art it was going to help produce, its role being different from that played by the plethora of uh, public art consultancies, which the, the new uh, cultural climate had fostered, a uh, platform or um, artelier, many of them, uh, in fact, brokering uh, deals to decorate corporate uh, lobbies. Uh, functioning rather like uh, Locus Plus in Newcastle, Art Angel never planned to mediate between a client and an artist. That's not exactly how their commissions uh, worked. 
The emergence of such agencies continued uh, under new labor when Blair confirmed rather than overturned the system of new public management that the, the Tories had favored and adopted a policy of what art workers started uh, calling targetolatry, a focus on targets, uh, which only at least medium sized organizations can monitor. So not just attendance, not simply monitoring attendance, but also the age of, that, of their audience, occupation, the diversity of that audience. The new need for accountability in part explained why over time the Arts Council gradually withdrew from funding individual artists in favor of funding organizations and cultural infrastructures which had the resources and staff to provide feedback on their actions and sorrow, uh, sorry, um, uh, thorough self-assessments. Uh, in a fraught cultural context, the, the punitive cuts of the Thatcher, but then also later of the coalition uh, government, uh, but also the political agenda of the Blair government's uh, focus on the bountiful creative industries. Uh, the emergence of private charities aiming at supporting art and public engagement with culture appears almost paradoxically as a Tory dream of public disinvestment. The independent and semi-independent public art commissioning agencies, often charities uh, in, the, in the UK, um, we can mention uh, uh, basement group, outset situations, artichoke, uh, navigated a context where the notion of the artist as isolated producer of artistic meaning had come under strain, uh, where they were thinking of also taking into account the people who allow the emergence of the work, uh, art in general present, present themselves as producers, or its actualization in the eyes and even the hands of an active audience of participants. Uh, Claire Bishop's British adaptation of Nicola Boyo's Esthétique Relationnelle as art's social turn and reliance on uh, delegated performance or audience participation. This is something uh, we could see in a, the Art Angel project, um, The Battle of Orgreave by Jeremy Della, with um, uh, former miners reenacting the battle. From the 70s onward, and with the development of post-sculptural works which resisted commodification, uh, Biennales had started promoting one-off, site-specific, often spectacular installations. And so private foundations and trusts became increasingly involved in their production. The Henry Moore Foundation, whenever sculpture is concerned, of course, the Elephant Trust, um, Calouste gobel Kian, the Fine Family Foundation. Uh, both because their input was needed to support these developing new forms and because the new artistic paradigm allowed them to become involved without needing to then uh, collect, display and preserve uh, a collection, a bit like the uh, Dia Foundation in New York, whose collection mostly of earthworks uh, does not require um, a big budget for um, conservation or uh, exhibition uh, in a very expensive New York. So in the market-led climate of the 1980s, this more traditional way of financing art, harking back to pre-market structures, has therefore survived and flourished art commissioning. Percent for art policies, the section 106 agreement in it, which prescribes the inclusion of public art in planning permissions, which is not statutory requirement in Britain, but uh, um, has become the largest reason for commissioning art, meaning that public art commissioning in the UK is mostly originated from the private sector. In 2015, uh, the public art think tank Ixia confirmed that the main driver for public art that continued to be private sector money aligned to public sector policy, especially national planning policies. Also, the very format of a lot of the art produced today, its professionalism, its scale, its technological advancement, mean that artworks are now conducted like projects uh, needing planning, infrastructure, uh, uh, and money. Art Angel have excelled. Uh, in uh, uh, conducting this, uh, creating Rachel Whitred's uh, house uh, and the civil engineering involved in casting the inside of the terraced house and then peeling its exterior walls off. Uh, this is a, 
uh, a perfect example of uh, research-based work requiring long pre-production uh, 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 time. But um, Beck's sponsorship uh, is also um, uh, something that was part of House's uh, hybridized budget. Artangel may have started out as an alternative funding solution offered to artists working outside of a gallery, but also to art patrons who do not necessarily wish to own the works. Uh, backers of uh, such agencies are rewarded with more immaterial rewards, which pertain to social distinction. They're invited to dinners, private views. Uh, they're given artists um, uh, multiples. Uh, it is, however, difficult to see it as an alternative organization today, considering the large number of trusts or foundations now working alongside artists without the permanent exhibition space, refining ever more elaborate bespoke models of funding and production and collaborating with public and private backers. In the context, and this is my conclusion, of British philanthropy, Art Angel is an operative body which allows, allows gift giving first to operate on the same level as public and corporate funding, but also to orient cultural trends. Uh, creative uh, Philanthropy, published by Leed and Anheyer uh, in 2006, suggests that a lot of the most innovative funding today is of the non-democratic sort and comes from trusts and foundations. Uh, who work with the public, but on their own terms. It seems that private collectors, foundations, not-for-profit organizations with uh, substantial backing have become the more obvious partners artists uh, turn to in order to uh, take on increasingly ambitious, large-scale and site-specific uh, projects. At the turn of the century, um, these um, um, Funding uh, solutions um, uh, anti, um, have been attacked by anti opioids or anti greenwashing groups who have shed light on um, some of the darker as aspects of this widespread hybridization of art funding and mostly on the imbalance between the money that these corporations or foundations invest and the benefits that they actually uh, reap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte, for this uh, brilliant talk, finishing a really brilliant session. Um, I'm sorry that on Google Meet we do not have the little clapping hands that we have on Zoom, but um, I think everyone would agree with me that this, this was a brilliant session. Um, so we're first going to start by giving the opportunity to Charlotte uh, Gould, Christine Zumelo and Enrique uh, to um, talk together um, to see the intersection of their, their papers that had so many intersection. Um, I know that, of course, a lot of you are going to want to talk about uh, this question of uh, art as an asset as it has become in the last decades. But um, I would like to maybe guide you for the beginning of this discussion between um, yourselves on one thing that I've seen intersecting in your talks, um, the fact that um, financialization has been appearing less monolithic, less, less visible, as if they were hiding a bit more the influence of finance, be it in Henrique's talk about the decentralization, the mixed financing uh, at the end of the, um, um, in, in the very early, um, in the last um, years, or in Christine's talk, this idea of diversification um, to sort of give legitimacy to finance and what Charlotte talked about in the hybridization of sponsorship, for example, is there this idea that finance is um, either hiding or using a softer approach, a more a less visible, more decentralized, diversified, hybridized approach? The floor is yours, Henrique, Charlotte and Christine. I think the spectrum is so wide between what Christine has presented um, and I'm thinking is um, of uh, art funds because they also exist in, in Britain. You find them in Britain as well. This idea that uh, um, artworks are now sold as part of a portfolio of people who simply invest and they're, they're, uh, they are I've, I've visited some of their websites and it's really interesting to see how they they, they tell you, oh, take a, a little bit of, of this and a, a little bit of the um, 
uh, abstract expressionism and mix it with these uh, new trendy contemporary artists and that will make your portfolio what we guarantee is that you're going to uh, make money <laughs> to, in the end it's completely it's, it's unashamedly uh, presented as a, as an investment uh, i don't know christine if you are aware of uh, tristan tremo's book on that question uh, in art we trust um which is also about art trusts uh and 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 other agencies and um, uh, my focus was mostly on Artangel, but th there are many very different models of how uh, the, the hybrid model uh, uh, works. And so the, the, that question, and it also changes um, uh, over time, that question of uh, how much public money, how much private or corporate money is, uh, uh, is introduced. So um, I'd say, I, I'm sure Christine and Enrique have a, a, a lot to say about this, that we're looking at a, a very large spectrum going from hiding these, some of these uh, um, intentions to, to making them completely transparent and obvious. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, and, and uh, for starting this discussion. I, I totally agree with you. Also, I wanted to say that uh, thank you for bringing up this idea of trust, because there is, when you, when you talk to uh, some of the uh, high net worth individuals, wealth manager, managers, uh, there's a certain amount of secrecy, uh, obviously, that, that there's, there's a bunch of off the record discussions, um, who manages what? What's what's in the fund? Um, and and that's the OTC nature that I was I was talking about at the end, where it is difficult uh, for it's not public. So and that goes against obviously um, the working of a quote. I'm, I'm using quotes here. A normal stock market or sure, uh, where uh, it's it, you you say in finance that you go public okay when you when your when your your stock is listed on the stock market it means that there's a certain number of things that are open that are um, that everybody can see that obviously shareholders can see and it's not at all the case uh, for uh, most if not all of the art fund uh, wealth uh, wealth funds uh, that are constituted of uh, artwork. So it's, it's very much a sort of a in between middle ground uh, territory that is aiming at um, uh, becoming this financial asset class or becoming taken seriously by the financial world with many, many, many issues of legitimacy also from the artist's point of view. Uh, and also as, as Sophie was also saying this morning, she was talking about um, um, the primary market and the secondary market and, and how the two uh, uh, do not obviously necessarily have um, the, same, the same goals, the same aims, uh, and, and there's many, many issues about price uh, and the same both cases. I completely agree with you. Uh, I, th I think the fragmentation of the sponsorship and the production of a mixed models like public and private models or, or pub public to private models uh, produce strange things, a strange phenomenon in, in art market and art institutions. For example, uh, nowadays in Brazil, we are leaving a huge problem with the, the public, private public model. Uh, Bernardo Paz, uh, a huge collector of uh, Inglaterra, use the, this kind of model to do not pay taxes and it create a huge a huge international problem with the state with the with the cities with the artists from new zealand from usa from uk so different to uh, differently of uh, clear and helping the the system of art of course it, it helps so uh, principally when the welfare state is in decreasing, uh, the, the private model is, is, is a way to, to produce a huge difference into this, this system for me. So it's a, I like to, to call it a, a double-edged knife. There is, there is two, two, two edges, a, a great edge that's important edge to, to help the artists, to help the institutions, 
to promote art in the internationalization model, but all the or the edge that's a problematic a huge a huge problem for the financials for the state policies and yes that, that i think you're right that focus on the financial question today really brought out this double edge um, um, component and it really brought out those outsized personalities that the art world is so accustomed to. I mean, we've seen Charles Saatchi with uh, Charlotte. So, um, would you would you want to say a bit more about the, the those outsides collectors and their you know their influence on the finance? Maybe here in France we have uh, undeniable figures like uh, Bernard Nault and François Pinault, uh, they have all tools, institutionals, but financial tools to, to produce a, a huge and difficult thing. It's a conversion of capitals. So the, this kind of collector and this kind of institution could uh, convert economic and social accumulated capital into a symbolic and artistic capital through appropriation of the uh, that is small historical events. They they can, uh, for example, influence, uh, uh, promote, uh, uh, promote uh, exhibitions at Paletto Q. Paletto Q nowadays it's a it's a municipal uh, institution that depends from the private capital uh, and principally from the capital uh, from the luxury industry. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, the exhibition uh, in catalog of, of Paletto Cure, uh, Carte Blanche and uh, in Hof, <clears throat> has received all the budget from the Britain uh, leisure brand Berber. So it's a, it's a complicated thing for me. This kind of collectors as Pinot and Arnaud, uh, they are really and huge they have a huge importance for the, the cultural field in France, but at the same time, they could, uh, through their institution and, and through their, this kind of conversion of capital, promote these clusters of artists uh, and, and promote different patterns in detriment to other patterns in, in the logical of uh, narratives in art world. I don't know if I if, if I was clear. Yeah, yeah, no, very clearly. Um, Charlotte and Christine, do you want to answer anyway? We have already some questions coming up. Maybe just just one comment, uh, Benedict. Um, so I mean, I, I talked about um, managing for a client or managing for a third party, but um, most banks, including in particular uh, JP Morgan, Chase, and uh, Citi, but also Bank of America, have their own in-house collection, art collection, which is a different, uh, it's, it's a different, um, a different field, but in itself uh, is, is, is something that they also uh, take into account in, into their own portfolio of how the bank does, but it, it's not uh, client, it's not client related. We have a question from Adriana Turpin. Well, it was also sort of a comment, sorry, and it was fairly obvious as a historian, I was about to say this, but I love the way in which you talked about pre-market conditions. And I think that's absolutely fascinating because of course, you know, you do immediately remind us of the importance of private collectors who happen to be princes, but whose taste, if you like, was just as uncertain. And indeed, in a way, they also used advisors. And I don't, I mean, I think this is again something that we see, I'm sure we have with Pino and Arno, that there are advisors in many different ways. Um, so I suppose, I think it might take the conversation too far, but I'd love us to think about it. This way in which this pre-market, if you like, situation works in the current market, where obviously it is more about finance, perhaps, or not. Sort of, you know, Christine suggested it, might be to do with making profit or you know investment in art but equally we've looked at it you know from the point of view of philanthropy so 
it's more an invitation possibly for future discussion, but I thought it was absolutely wonderful to see this as this kind of mixing of markets. So thank you. Thank you. Marie Tavino, you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, no problem. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for these papers. I think they were very uh, interesting, illuminating, and I'm including Sophie in all this. Um, I think it's going to be a general question. I'm wondering, with the sort of more open financialization of the art market, what consequences, what impact do you see on the market ecosystem, on the work of artists? Do you see a sort of partitioning of the market into art that is a commodity? or art that is an anti-commodity, or is this too, um, too blunt to distinction? Charlotte, you want to answer? I think it's, it's a very interesting question, but also a very difficult one, because um, it's not that clearly uh, um, um, separated or, or distinguishable. Uh, you have a lot of artists creating uh, um, work that is site specific, even ephemeral, and uh, you'd think that it would not be commodifiable, and yes, yet it is, um, because our market structures have uh, changed. Uh, what we value has changed. We value attention, we value uh, um, yes, uh, uh, presence, engagement, participation, and uh, uh, what might uh, have been uh, read as uh, something maybe uh, deriving from the tradition of uh, performance or um, uh, dematerialized uh, work today uh, uh, enters the market. Uh, and uh, also works done maybe outside the gallery, outside the museum, uh, also done in the public sphere or uh, in, uh, in, in public. And yet now the street is also becoming privatized. And uh, uh, in London, it's very clear uh, the, the, the streets are um, supervised by BIDs, by business incentive. Uh, districts that they, they monitor, they supervise, they animate, they uh, uh, also uh, uh, um, pay for uh, cultural animation or for the art. Uh, but uh, the idea is that they reap benef commercial benefits from that because uh, uh, because of, uh, re of real estate. <laughs> I think real estate is very much connected to uh, uh, to art, which uh, uh, presents itself as uh, being non-commodifiable. It happens in between occupations of uh, uh, buildings or um, uh, 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 factories, uh, and yet it's going to raise the price of real estate. So, yeah, a very difficult question, I think. Uh, thank you, Mary, for this for this question, um, which which um, obviously. Uh, sends us to another uh, another huge question, which uh, which is a very broad uh, investigative field in itself. It's the question of democratization of financial markets, uh, which is a myth and reality of that. And I'm thinking in particular of one of the ways in which financial markets have been quote unquote democratized is, for example, the creation of online brokers, Charles Schwab. Where you just can go on a boursicoteur, you can your home uh, behind your computer, and you can build your own uh, little portfolio and, and 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 monitor everything that happens every day. And obviously, the idea or what the selling idea is that the fees, um, the commissions, are lower because it's online. And and Charles Schwab has become definitely uh, one of the major online uh, brokers, but it has not definitely not definitely not replaced. Uh, the brokers, uh, the, the major brokerage firms uh, in finance. So all the platforms through which, so it's, your question is also leading us to the idea of disintermediation for artists. For artists, uh, can they sell throughout um, uh, platforms without going through a gallery? Uh, and, and we know that the, the prices for the gallery will, will charge for, uh, for the 
in the primary market is very high compared to what the artist himself or herself uh, will receive. So th this is a work in progress and um, uh, maybe there is also something to unpack as to what exactly uh, is uh, is happening compared to uh, to, uh, to to the discourse. Um, and again, uh, something that's particularly important, um, even for, of course for art, art historians, and I think this makes this encounter between all of us today very interesting, is uh, the discourse, the explanation, the historical background that you can give to work of other political meaning, the aesthetic, of course, uh, which is also what people will do in finance and roadshows. Um, of course, the, the object is very different. Uh, but it's, it's also something that would be missing uh, if we only go online. You just have to find your own meaning. Thank you, Christine. Um, we're soon going to take a questions on the YouTube, although I can't see any popping up yet. But we also have a question from Sophie Kra. Yes, thanks a lot for these uh, very exciting papers. And uh, my question is, is uh, probably more for Christine. And um, I, I've, um, I've been very interested in the way you were describing these uh, firms or online platforms as uh, mimicking the logic of the financial markets without like completely um, um, actually endorsing these modes of operation. It's more like, um, again, a metaphor than a reality in, in many ways. And um, I'm, I'm curious about whether um, I don't know if you, if you can um, state how much uh, active these platforms really are, like what kind of volumes do they actually handle, how real is all that? <laughs> I'm just wondering whether it's not, you know, again, more of a pretense than, you know, actual uh, operations uh, on, on the market. Uh, thank you, Sophie, and you, you hit it right on the, on, on the head, on the nail. Uh, the major issue here is volume and scope uh, of the markets, and, and this is why I brought up the CME, and I didn't show you the volumes of uh, the everyday trades, but it's nothing what happened on, it, on the, um, quote, art securitized market is, is, is really absolutely insignificant in terms of volume compared to uh, the volumes traded of contracts and the options and futures every day on the CME. So it's a very, 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 very niche, boutique, experimental. Um, and, and, and that's what I find both fascinating and interesting is that it's both trying to aim at using the tools uh, that are used in finance, uh, but in terms of size or in terms of another thing that uh, financiers like very much is statistical um, statistical viability, uh, it, it just doesn't exist. Uh, but maybe it's for the better uh, of the art market. I mean, that's what I think, but uh, there, it's, 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 it's a sort of deformed mirror image between the two. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I don't think there are any questions left and uh, the lunchtime is calling us right now um, and um, I we will take a break um, for um, the uh, on the YouTube and we will just put on a holding page and we will soon be back afterwards for session two government subsidies and taxation thank you very much <laughs>